Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now in today's video I'm continuing with the slide bars. I started them in part one and I'm going to finish them in part two. Now I'm going to get straight down to it today but before I begin I'd just like to thank some of the commenters from the part one video. First of all there was some good ideas raised and I'm going to incorporate some of these ideas into my workings. Also a couple of you couldn't refrain from using some big words in the comments and I had to go and consult the thesaurus, so thank you for expanding my education. I will say, however, that I do actually know quite a few big words, for instance, um, wheelbarrow. Anyway, off to the milling machine. To kick off part two, I will pick up from where I left in part one, and that was with my components looking like this. So these are the slide bars in what will be their running position, and they were, of course, machined as a stack upside down. Now by doing this as a stack you can see that what I've got is quite a few features for the number of setups. So there's a lot of holes there and these are well on their way to being finished. Now one thing in part one I said that these features in green were going to be left off because I didn't have the dimensions for them. Well I've decided that's not really good enough because if I don't put them in now then I'm going to supposedly finish these and then at a later date I'm going to have to dismantle them all and start remachining them, re deburring everything and who knows that process may have to repeat several times before I get all the features. So what I've done is I've spent some time with the drawings and I have calculated based on all the available dimensions where these things should end up so I'm going to be brave and based on those calculations I'm going to go ahead and machine them on so that by the end of this video these are actually fully finished and will not have to be revisited. Now um, I know somebody is going to want to see how I calculated these positions so don't worry I have put a video together showing me going through the uh, sketching and drawing drawings and um, for anyone who wants to see that I will release a video shortly. Now on with today's topics and what I'm basically going to be doing is putting those slots I've just shown into the components, these slots in green. Um, I'm going to be putting in the oiling hole. Now uh, this actually just shows one oil hole. I don't think that's particularly suitable because a lot of the sliding surfaces on these are at the edges and one oil hole in the middle isn't going to get to anything so I have redesigned the oiling system and you'll see more of that when I get to making the crossheads but for now all I'm going to do is put two oil holes in they're going to be tapped to accept some kind of cup or um, oil can um, adapter and so that will give me two tapped holes also I have studied the support mechanism for this I did show in an earlier video that there's another support that mounts on this end so I'm going to be putting four tapped holes in towards this end to accept that again so that when I eventually get there I'm not having to start drilling and tapping into a what could be a finished piece. So with that said I'm going to set the milling machine up and put these slots in. Here comes the slots and I require one here and one here. Now I could try and do these one at a time in a vise but I'm going to try and get them all in one go as a four together. Now I've arranged these just using a square to get them roughly in the right place and I have started by clamping a piece of aluminium packing down over two of them. I have then indicated it such that that back edge is square to the table. I have put a temporary clamp in position and that has clamped this one down in a perpendicular fashion and that's now going to be my reference for setting the rest of them. Now don't tell the apprentice instructor but what I'm going to do is set my digital calipers to the width of these components down here and I am then going to use it up at this end to ensure that the arrangement is parallel. Now from the milling of these long slots I've got a, a very slight amount of outward spring so I'm just going to set the caliper in its clamped position like this and that is now holding this edge parallel to the reference edge and with that in position I'm going to run my indicator along the end and check all the ends are in line. You could of course put dowel pins in these holes and run the clock across the holes, uh, across the pins, sorry. Now 
With that arrangement set, I've now positioned another clamp straddling these two pieces, so this back end is pretty much now set in place. I can now remove my cheating calipers because I have installed two more clamps here, and with those in place I can remove my temporary clamp and move to my final pincering arrangement. And the final pincer move was to get a long clamp that comes overhead of one of the other clamps and contacts a bridging piece that spans the T-slot and makes sure that these little middle ends are well and truly down. Now, is this a textbook clamping setup? No. Is this acceptable for lots of different scenarios? No. But is this acceptable for what I'm doing here? Yes. Primarily because my finished machining depth of these slots is only 15 thou. So it's very light machining forces and by arranging it like this I can obviously get everything in one go. I have checked with an indicator that everything is still well aligned and it's fine. I have checked for cutter clearances in the appropriate locations and it's okay. And finally I'm checking the clamping arrangement and everything appears to be okay. So I'm going to proceed to cut this now. Um, now contrary to my sketch, uh, the numbers I've calculated give me slot widths of quite dissimilar sizes uh, as opposed to these rather symmetrical ones I've drawn on here. However, I'm not disheartened because a image of the actual locomotive exhibit similar proportions. So what I found in my calculations is that the slot at the front is much narrower than the one at the back and I doubt you can actually see that unless I really show you but you can just about see at the front a very small relief whereas at the back it's much longer. So uh, that's similar to what I've arrived at with my calculations. I've double checked them so off we go. I have the Decal FP1 set at 1200 RPM. I am in line with the slot and I'm going to do this in three depths to take me to a completed depth of 15 thou. That's uh, 0.38 of a millimetre for the metric viewers. Now uh, this is all rather close but I think it's going to be fine. Well, I couldn't have formed a bigger burr if you'd paid me, but apart from that, that's come out fine. Okay, cutouts milled in, and you can see what I mean about the burrs. Um, a couple of other factors that may have added to the burrs. One is spindle speed. By modern machine standards, 1200 RPM is really quite low for a cutter of that diameter. Also, you've got the material. This is tool steel. Were this free cutting mild steel, I would have expected a much lesser burr, but any deficiencies in the cutter, particularly on tall steel, it does tend to throw up quite a stiff burr. Oh, um, B flat. Anyway, I am now uh, finished with working on the table, so I'm going to put the vice on. I'm just about to load this part in the vise, but before I do so, I want to get rid of the burrs. Now here is a little tip. When trying to deburr something like this with a stone or a file, it can be tricky because you're trying to remove the burr, but you're trying not to dig into what will be a running surface. Now the problem is, when you try and use anything on this to get rid of the burr, the tendency is for the front end of it to dig in to the surface. Equally, if you try and avoid that by leaning backwards, you tend to round this back end off. So, how can you deburr this without digging in? Well, let me show you a method. Having made sure everything is clean, I'm going to put a piece of cigarette paper down. I'm then going to take a very fine needle file, and let me show you something. If I put the needle file on the cigarette paper, that can go back and forwards all day, it's not going to dig into anything. So here's the trick. I lay the cigarette paper down on the running surface and I then take the file and put a good amount of the file onto the cigarette paper. 
Now the, the significance of how much you're putting on the cigarette paper is that you're spreading the file over more surface area and therefore the pressure you're applying takes longer to wear through so that's quite important. You want a good amount of cigarette paper under the file and then what I'm going to do with my other fingers and hand is I'm going to very slightly belly the file and then I'm going to use the belly of the file to do the deburring. All that means that the front won't dig in because it's riding on the cigarette paper and the back won't round off because I've slightly bellied it and I'm using the belly to do the uh, deburring. So that should look something like this. So I'm going to get all lined up. Uh, a reasonable amount of pressure, there's no need to be too light on the cigarette paper and I'm then going to belly the file and deburr this. As soon as any dirt gets under there you have to clean it or else you're not making good contact. This is quite a stiff burr here so I've moved my thumb further forwards to get a bit more pressure on it. Nearly there now. Obviously the course of the file you use, the uh, quicker this is, but the more risky chance of scratching the surface up. Alright, it's looking rather nice. Okay, so there is some nicely deburred edges. Uh, a light stoning with some oil will make a nice job of that face. My parts are going in the vise and next up comes some hole drilling. Now I'm going to be putting in the holes for these oiling arrangements and also the four holes I described for the mounting arrangements. Now when holding two parts in the vise like this that are a similar width the first thing to do is check with the micrometer that they are a very similar width. Uh, a vise is not forgiving in that plane so similar widths are a must. But also, even with similar widths, it's helpful to use some kind of medium on the moving jaw to take out any differences between the two and to spread the clamping forces slightly better than just the hard jaw does. So a common trick is to lie a piece of paper down in there so that the paper spreads the clamping forces slightly. Um, paper, however, is no good if you're using flood coolant. So what I like to do is take a piece of plastic. This, uh, by the way, is from the uh, the wrapper of a bag of tie wraps and with some uh, slightly more pressure there I am able to just put that there and when the moving jaw tightens up that will balance the clamping forces slightly I also want to set my ends with a square okay and I'm leaving just enough overhanging so I can do my edge finding on both axes and Oh, I've lost my uh, plastic. One moment. Okay. Okay, normally of course you would mallet this down, but as you may have noticed, what I've had to do is a little bit of rearranging. I'm drilling close to the edges, so I can't afford a parallel on either side. Now, were this a solid piece of material, I would have just had both parallels out and drilled it at that. The vise would have held one piece quite easily. However, because I've got two pieces, I wanted to leave one parallel in the middle where the drill bits won't hit it. And that's because, let's say the bottom piece is slightly narrower than the top piece, I run the risk of the drill bit pushing the bottom piece down, perhaps at one end, even with the plastic. So I've just reshuffled that parallel into the middle, and I'm now going to proceed to drill these holes. I'll do it in fast forward. Uh, just a bit of drilling and tapping but I will show you this this is something I've been sent by a subscriber it's an electronic edge finder and when it makes contact with two bits of metal on the machine it flashes red so that's a, a nice little device I believe he got it from Cromwell Tools and the brand on it is PEC PEC USA uh, it's spindle mounted of course and makes edge finding Rather easy. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, I'm just going to edge it forward as if you're using any other kind of edge finder and as soon as it flashes red I'll stop. That's it. Now uh, with a non-rotating edge finder like that you could of course rotate your spindle 90 or 180 degrees and see if you get similar readings but I'm pretty happy with this spindle. So I'll now check the end. And again, there we are. Easy as that. On to tapping and I'm doing this in the milling machine with my tapping chuck. This uh, floats on a plain diameter and I just wind this by hand. If you'd like any more details look at my video making a tapping chuck. Now I have got absolutely no idea why I thought 2BA was an appropriate size for these oiling holes. Uh, there is going to be an adapter in there but even still that's far too big I think. Uh, uh, 4BA would have been a much more appropriate size but I can't put any metal back on and I'm not starting again so that's what I've got. Okay here comes some tapping. That is all the work on these top pieces done. Now what you're seeing here is the interesting process of me doing my sketches and uh, making design adjustments and then seeing how they come out in real life. And I have a few things to mention. One is the holes I've already mentioned that. I think uh, 4BA or even smaller would have been more suitable. You will see why uh, this arrangement has been done when I come to make the crossheads. In terms of lubrication it's going to work very well. Uh, my concern is how much of a disturbance to the running piece on this side I'm going to cause by putting those big holes there. Now also on that same topic is the question of should these four holes have been blind holes? Now I thought quite long and hard about this and I was very tempted to um, on this side leave it undisturbed. So in other words when I drilled through I would have drilled through from the top so that these holes were blind holes and therefore less disturbance to the running surface. Now I decided to go all the way through with them because I was a bit concerned that by the time I drilled a blind hole, tapped a blind hole uh, and uh, tried to get all the depths as close as possible I would have a ended up with not many usable threads but also often when you try and work very close to a surface you can end up disturbing the flatness and so I thought I would rather just have straight through holes which I can then flatten off with a stone and uh, also I thought perhaps these holes would retain a small amount of oil um, as the piece is running. So I've gone for through holes, looking at it and looking at the thicknesses and proportions of the threads I could probably have got away with blind holes um, but it is worth remembering in all these scenarios that I am by no means uh, an expert on locomotive design. Anyway so that is that. Not much to go now, I've got a bit of chopping to do. Now here's something I've not yet discussed and this is the topic of these small pieces here. So far that piece looks like this and to turn it from this into these end pieces what I'm going to do is chop it here and here. Now that may seem slightly wasteful because I'm going to be left over with a piece in the middle but it did make it very handy and um, it's made it such that all the holes line up with everything else so that's how I'm going to finish these off. Also I've been thinking about the assembly 
of these pieces and how it all interacts and if I leave this as the tuning fork arrangement so I've got it here it's going to make it very difficult to do future disassemblies and reassemblies of various components. If I leave it like this then once I assemble the uh, piston and cylinder cover and crosshead I'm not going to be able to separate the crosshead and slide bars without taking things uh, on the actual piston assembly to bits because I will not have the clearance to get everything out of the front end. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to split this down the middle here such as I have two pieces that can then be assembled from the sides. Now I don't expect what I've just said to make much sense to anyone unless you're particularly familiar with locomotive design but the video I've got coming out next showing some uh, drawing might um, help to illustrate. Either way all you need to know is that to finish these components off I'm going to do some chopping here and here and down the middle and then finish those faces and I'm done. Tuning forks split with a hacksaw and what I'm going to do uh, to hold them is I'm going to line the parallels up with the join between them and hopefully they will then each sit nicely on a, a join. And uh, that should give me something to uh, clean them up with. On to my little end pieces and uh, with these only being an eighth of an inch thick I'm opting for a wavy parallel to sit them on. So the beauty of a wavy parallel is that you can compress it and uh, you don't end up clamping the parallel instead of the part. Now, with pieces like this I would normally try and situate them on either end of the vise with a slight overhang so that I can take a dimension but with the nature of this parallel and vise I'm going to aim for more in the middle and I'll have to um, drop some kind of depth micrometer down the side. I have repeated the setup for the smaller two parts and that leaves me with only a bit of chamfering and deburring to go before I am uh, finished. A picture of a slide bar and two spread out slide bars. With uh, the exception of some finished deburring and a bit of polishing up, that is it, everything's finished. I could go on and uh, make the fasteners and assemble this, but I've had enough, so uh, I'm calling it quits on the video for now. Um, hopefully when it's laid out like this you can see what I meant in my earlier comments when I explained about making the pieces individually versus trying to come up with some method of doing it uh, along the lines of what I've done and basically if you had taken each little piece and tried to make it on its own and then put it together and expected all the holes and edges to line up you could be in for some hard work so hopefully what you've seen here is that by doing this as a, a, a stack um, I've pretty much got all the holes and edges to line up for free. Well, there's been quite a bit of talking in this video, so I give you full permission to go and sit in a dark room for a while and recover from this presentation. I personally am also going to go and sit in a dark room and recover from my choice of two BA threads for those uh, four holes. Uh, but apart from that, I'm happy with how this has come out. I think they're going to work well. And I'm looking forward to getting them mounted on the cylinder blocks. Well, that's it. Slide bars done and dusted. As locomotive components go, they were fairly straightforward. The next thing I'll be doing is I will be taking those slide bars and I'll be fitting them to the cylinder blocks. Until then, I hope you found this interesting. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.